educators again here in uh, Pflugerville ISD. There are about 10 of us here today. And so I'm going to let you get started whenever you're ready, Mark. Okay, so uh, we were supposed to have three people on the panel, so Cliff may join us later. But we have Dr. Fred Bushy. Um, so he works with a WinTech Geo and Brookhaven College uh, Geotechnical Institute. And he's done sessions in the past. Uh, I know one you've done is sedimentary rocks, right? That's correct. Um, and then we have John Lamazny, um, and he works with John Lamaz or Lamazny Consulting. Um, and he's done several sessions with us as well on uh, cybersecurity as well as advertising. Um, and then if Cliff joins us, um, uh, just so he can jump in, um, he works for Profitable Growth Services and has done sessions on GMOs. Um, so what I'd like um, both of you to do is just sort of introduce yourself, talk about um, how you got introduced to Nepris and, and some, some thoughts about what you do, and then I'll, I will seed you with some initial questions and we'll take questions from the audience, okay? I started out, uh, I got my PhD from uh, the University of New Mexico. Uh, I don't give away my age, but uh, my PhD dissertation was involved with the first return lunar samples from Apollo 11 and the relationship to meteorites. So that prepared me for about three years as uh, teaching people how to fly and then going into uh, uranium exploration and development, followed by uh, base and precious metal research and development followed by a stint with EPA in um, Ada, Oklahoma at the Center of Groundwater Research, followed by 10 years at IBM. So needless to say, I've not done anything very long anywhere, but I certainly have a lot of things I enjoy talking about. Awesome. And currently, I have a little consulting company that uh, does uh, microbiological enhanced oil recovery, and I teach uh, part-time at Brookhaven College in, in Farmer's Ranch or Dallas, Texas. Uh, my name is Sean Lamazdi. I am a technologist primarily, a graphic designer, uh, and in general, I like to use technology to help people, and there's lots of ways that that can happen. Uh, most of the ways that I make that happen is working with libraries, working with academia. As a matter of fact, I spent about 14 years in academia as both a uh, instructional technologist and as a faculty member. And now I'm just a faculty member and do all of my technology work as an independent consultant. Thank you. So first question to get us all started is um, what was the most um, engaging exchange you have had with students? Um, and, and what do you attribute to that engagement? So um, basically we're talking about what, what makes a successful session between you, the classroom, and the teacher. So John, you want to get started? Absolutely. So in, especially in distance learning, <laughs> uh, there has to be clarity and there has to be, I think, as much sense-oriented interaction as possible. In other words, if, if you can get if you could use distance learning and get smells into the room, which sounds really funny, but it would give you another dimension that we don't have over distance. And so the, the most successful sessions for me over distance learning have been ones that are multimodal in which uh, there's text-based communication, video-based communication, possibly uh, physical interactions if we're using any kind of remote hardware that, that has something like that. Uh, like, for instance, we have used, uh, not with Nepris necessarily, but we have used uh, writing tools in order to um, sort of do real-time design on screen and be able to sketch something out and see each other, you know, and if I do screen sharing, we can begin to get to that, and if I use a pen with that. Uh, so just the most successful sessions for me are ones in which as many modes as possible are touched upon and so that we can change uh, modes of thinking or uh, be more attractive to visual learners versus verbal learners at certain points in the presentation. So if you can use materials in lots of different ways, I think that sessions for distance learning are more effective that way. And can you say a little bit about um uh, one of your sessions, so I, I pop in this up just so the everyone could see it. So you did one here on career and cybersecurity information technology, and um, 
So just, just for the, the teachers in the room, you can see over here was Stephanie from Bossier Parish in Louisiana actually requested this one. She put in a description and key questions and so forth. Um, and then of course we record these sessions, but can you sort of just talk about your experiences with this one a little bit? Absolutely. So uh, this was different than my other NEPRIS session in that my other NEPRIS session was much more, uh, much more fluid and interactive. Whereas with this session, I got the questions ahead of time, much like today. And, and often there are some questions, but I got a long list of questions for this particular session because it was really an interview. And I went so far as to write out my answers, uh, which again, going into multimodal, because I was able to write out my answers, I was able to really think about the answers uh, effectively. And then my video was almost like rehearsed, my, the, the video session that we did. So each of, the, each of the questions was asked independently and I talked through my answers, but I also had this text-based version that I was able to point that classroom to, to see a sort of different way of interpreting that information. And uh, I wrote up a post about it and was able to uh, point back, point people back to that. Um, it was a great session and it was uh, only odd in that the students didn't really vary or go away from the questions at all. It was, it was rather strict in that particular classroom that they were staying to those questions. Um, I personally prefer something a little bit more fluid, a little bit more flexible, so that we can go in a direction that's more useful uh, if we need to. But I loved that session, and I think that NEPRIS is a great platform for this purpose. So, Dr. Bushi, how about, how about you? What, what, what you? what kind of exchange have you had with students, and, and, and what do you attribute to their success? Well, um, I learned the hard way how to do word pictures because my first session, the camera didn't work and I was teaching sedimentary rocks. And if you're trying to teach sedimentary rocks and you can't give them any kind of idea of what a sedimentary rock looks like, you end up scrambling for words that fifth graders would understand that would describe a sedimentary rock and where it goes. And somehow it worked. I still don't know why, but apparently it worked well enough that uh, uh, people will still talk to me about that sort of thing, and the teacher was pleased with the outcome. So I think it was blind, dumb luck on my part. I've since solved that particular technology problem, so I don't appear, I don't think it's ever going to happen again, but that was the biggest challenge I think I've ever had, is teaching something that you need to look at with word pictures rather than just being able to show pictures so they'd understand. So you bring up a good point of technology sometimes fails. And there are advantages and disadvantages. So one disadvantage is when it fails, it, it, the, the lesson can go away. So that, that's one thing. So I know from a NEPR standpoint, we try to do technology checks and review sessions and, and, and prep uh, beforehand. Um, the other one, the other disadvantage that uh, Carol actually mentioned at the very beginning was I can't see the entire class. I'm seeing the sort of cone of, of visual um, into a class. Can you both talk about um, and, and I can also talk about some positives too, so it's all not negative. <laughs> um, but can you talk about the positive and negatives of this interaction and, and where it's actually advantageous over something else or, um, uh, and, and it can benefit, so. Uh, well, I can, I can definitely speak to technology failure. As, as a technologist, it's, it's a part of the, the work that I do every day. And the, what I've adopted as a strong philosophy for presentation for myself is to, to be prepared to speak without any technology at all. And with NEPRIS, that's, it, it, it has to, we have to at least have, you know, a basic connection of, of technology in order to have anything at all. But even in the classroom, if technology fails, you, you need to have backups, right? And so in the case of NEPRIS or other distance learning platforms, I think being able to go back to basics and being prepared to go back to basics in the event that you need to is essential as a skill for, for this kind of work. But in the best possible scenario, going to the other extreme that we were talking about with multimodal, you know, if you, if you can bring in a lot of different things, that does uh, raise the level of complexity 
and potentially increases the likelihood of failure. But uh, having in your mind a way to go back to, all you can do is hear me, can I still talk on this topic? And for me, the answer has to be yes before I show up for a session. And it is for Dr. Bushi too. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It, uh, I, I, I really, th that was the biggest surprise. I guess, I guess if you do a lot of lecturing and uh, you're trying to describe things, and you may or may not have a, uh, uh, some sort of uh, video or, or picture platform to talk from, I guess that's where you learn how to talk in word pictures. But uh, it is uh, something that's not fun, especially when you're dealing with fifth graders. Um, it's hard to keep their interest. And, uh, but technology failure, uh, well, let me put it this way. It's not the first time technology has failed me. Uh, I've had some issues in, even in my own classroom that were, had nothing to do with me, but it had to do with the version of, of, um, of, uh, Windows, uh, Office that were on the computers. They'd been, uh, re, uh, let me say, had things added to them, had piece parts changed and so on and so forth so many times that as a result of trying to present a video, the video wouldn't run because there was so much overhead on the machine, it couldn't run the video. And we saw, finally solved the problem, just to give you as an example, they upgraded finally on two computers that I was using because they knew I was using video to the newest version of uh, Office so that basically uh, I could show some HD videos. That solved the problem in an instant. So it's, I guess, what that means is, is if you're in the classroom or you're on this side, you better be pretty well up on whatever um, system you have with the latest software, because if you aren't, you're liable to fail, especially in the kind of thing we're trying to do here. Carol, you have a question. I, I have two, a comment and a, a kind of broader question. So yesterday we had somebody who answered your question mark that said she liked to do video conferences almost more than in the classroom because she could go into the enclosures with the animals rather than because she can't take her animals into the classrooms. So I think that was a great example of when using this kind of interaction benefits the students because even though they're not there, the one thing that I remember from that was that she said the kids are giving um, directions, there she is, are giving directions to the animals. They're actually giving commands to the animals and the animals were following them. So I thought that was a great example of that. But I also wondered if you could just take a quick break so if there are any questions here in the audience or comments that we could kind of jump in for a minute. Yep. Anybody? Well, what are your biggest uh, requests from, say, elementary classrooms right now? What, what is the trend out there? Is there one? Uh, so, uh, when we first started this whole project, we were thinking that high school would be the major, major group that would be using this and elementary would be down at the bottom of the list. It's actually, elementary is one of the strongest groups. So, um, and, and uh, what's interesting about elementary is it's very, it's, it's it almost goes to that fluid thing in some ways that, that John was talking about because it's, it's, it's more generalized and it's really getting them excited about a topic. Um, so the most common topics, uh, believe it or not, is probably going to be uh, fossils, rocks, weather, um, anything to do with tectonics, um, and uh, those are the. And then food. There's a lot of food ones. So whether it's uh, food nutrition or trying to create a food product of some sort or how food is made, um, those are probably the, off the top of my head. Those are the three biggest topics. Yeah, I think science-based conferences are going to be your most popular because. Those are hard for kids to experience if, and for teachers to teach at times because we don't have as many experiences with them. And we need to turn to professionals to help us out with it. So I agree with you in that aspect. The science-based ones are going to be more, more appropriate for uh, elementary for sure. Yeah. Um, and the, about, about video, one of the advantages that I see, and, and um, uh, Carol talked on a little bit, but um, it's basically you're able to bring into the classroom um, something theoretically that you can't do either in-person visit. It's just not possible. It's either across the country or it's, it's just too much overhead to get to a company or something. Um, but uh, if you look through some of the videos, you'll see things like a Samsung 
um, doing sort of a tour of inside the little uh, fab computer robot unit that was handling the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the disks that have all of the chips on them. And it's a very sterile environment. You have to put on clothes to go in there, but you're able to actually see that over video um, because obviously you don't have to worry about the contamination. Um, I know we had one session um, where this is elementary again, um, where um, they wanted, it was basically the topic was, tell me all you can about Egypt. We've had several of these where, tell me all you can about Malawi. Tell me all you can about whatever. Um, we actually have one in Nigeria tomorrow, I believe. Um, but we had a, um, we actually had a college student in the Egyptian one um, call in from Egypt, which uh, can be tricky with uh, technology. But what was really cool was he could actually, because it was video, because it was mobile, he actually put the video up to um, the, the window in his, in his apartment so you could see across the city of Cairo. So something like that is very unique to uh, the video kind of thing. I'm not saying that's you know, going to be all the time, but um, I, I, I often say that in-person is better than video, but in some cases I almost sometimes think video is better than in-person. So. Well, I know, and I, I'm on camera, I apologize. I know that... Um, some people have said to me, well, why don't you just show a video of, of Cairo because then you could get up closer and all, but then you're missing that personal aspect of the person pointing out sites, uh, talking about their own uh, stuff. And I know I did something similar. I was in Alaska and there was a glacier across the bay from where I, my brother's house and I was talking to fifth graders and I was just using an iPad tablet. You could, I could hold it up and those fifth graders could pick out that glacier on the other side. And just then an eagle flew by. So picked up the tablet, swooshed it across the sky so they could see that. You don't do that in, in a video. And videos, just video, I think, has a wonderful place in the world. But having that person behind it giving you a point of view is what really, to me, makes uh, video conferencing more powerful than just a video. And so you were, um, uh, I know John was talking about the different senses. So what was really cool, another cool one about the aspect about the Egypt one, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find it. I'm probably not gonna be able to easily. Let's see here. Um, but he got to the point where he was actually taking student names and drawing them. Let's see if we can find it here. So there he is. probably not worth it for, for what I'm trying to do here. But, but basically what I'm trying to say is he um, had a, a, the, the digital pen and took student names and wrote them in Arabic. And so we have these different screenshots for different student names in Arabic that they could take away after the session as well. So I just had a comment about this. And from a, from a technology teaching standpoint, I mean, there's a, a huge benefit to being able to, to only be the distance away from the screen to be able to see some detail that's going on in something like a screen share, as opposed to in the classroom where there might be 10 feet between somebody and the screen. And like just that small amount of distance can be an additional burden to somebody in the audience. Whereas if they're able to look at their screen right in front of them, especially with technology, they're going to have a, a closer, more direct connection with this thing that's a foot away from them than they do with something that's 10 feet away or if the projector's not bright enough for any other number of issues with the atmosphere of that environment. Whereas with um, using this kind of interface, you know, setting aside just the fact that somebody can be anywhere in the world and be able to get to this content, uh, but they only are a foot away. They're able to see every pixel of what's going on on screen as opposed to the classroom where it can be more difficult. Set up of the classroom is important. Um, right, right now the lights are off, which kind of makes it difficult to see you, but better to see us. You have the, the, the shades drawn. You're actually facing the camera. The lights are on. <laughs> Say what now? The lights are on. We are just they? Oh, it seems pretty dark though, okay. Uh, but the classroom setup is, is, is part of really a key aspect to this. And, um, and we have had teachers who have gone the lengths to, uh, there's a, I don't know if um, Flukerville has this or not, um, but there are a lot of um, classroom kind of management systems with computers where you can mirror the teacher's computer onto the student computer. So it's not the students logging in, but you're just mirroring what is on the computer onto a student computer. Um, and we've had several people uh, do that for their, for their classroom. So you're even bypassing and you're getting that, that upfront pixel 
kind of resolution that you want that John was talking about. So if you have that available in your school, that's that's something that can be powerful as well. And well, I think folks just told me they don't have it, so no. uh, we'll, we'll do different workarounds here. <laughs> Uh, one one last question for the uh, panel that I had, and that is, um, what what would you tell teachers um, to do with their class to make sure there's a successful session? So what what kind of so one one thing we don't want to have happen is the teacher treats this like a I have a I have a free day and I can sit in the back of the of the classroom. We really want this to be integrated into the curriculum and, and into what the students are learning. So what kind of things, what advice would you say to the teachers as far as getting the class prepared? I just have one comment before you say that. None of the teachers in Pflugerville do that kind of thing. But <laughs> no, never. Well, my, my thought in response is that um, there's, there's something to be said for the beauty of uh, lack of distraction. And so I have visited many classrooms in which it's almost like walking into uh, something from the television show Hoarders, you know, like classrooms that are just sort of overwhelmed with stuff. And I find it already potentially a distraction if somebody's reduced to a screen, to presence on a screen. So I would suggest that if there's anything that you can do to create more of like a clean white space as a classroom where anything can happen that allows you to, to extend more focus to something like a screen or something like a speaker for that matter. Whereas if you have loads of stuff on the walls and you have stuff piled up in corners and I mean, that's a problem anyway in a classroom, but certainly I think with distance learning, or a learning environment. Let's say it's not a classroom, but rather, you know, uh, people connecting from home. Uh, that's advice I give to everybody who I'm working with remotely is, you know, if you can take anything else that's going on on the, on the desktop machine or laptop and, and take it away so that it's not distracting you or calling you away from, this, from the attention of this thing, but also in the physical environment trying to create a space that is conducive to learning, but especially conducive to distance learning and distraction-free environment. The one thing I would probably suggest is that uh, uh, enough preparation of the students, not so much so that they cover the subject, but more of what questions do you really want the answer to? We can make a presentation and not answer the questions that some of the kids have. So if if we spend uh, part of our time discussing the overall thing and then make, and then if the kids have prepared questions that they can ask, that gives us an extension of what it is we think they want to know to what it is they do want to know. And that is very helpful if they have that preparation. So uh, one, one thing I do want to point out, I don't know if either of you have used this or not, um, but there's a send message button here. So there's, there's open communication back and forth between the teacher and there's an um, I don't know if you used that before, John or Dr. Bushi. So, um, but, but this is this is this request is not the end all be all of communication. Well, before you go on, we're getting a lot of feedback. So. Um, and it just started, but we're getting a loop back. That's all I really had to say, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. That was wonderful. <laughs> Any other last minute questions for the panel? No, that's great. We're ready to get started. <laughs> While we're sitting on screen, I want to point out that in the upper left hand corner, you'll notice there's a red dot and it says recording. So, uh, the nice thing uh, that I like about NEPRIS is because of that legal uh, requirement that you tell people you're recording them, that if they come in late, that's always visible to anyone who comes in. So it's covered you as far as, as telling people they're being recorded. It's always nice to tell them verbally at the beginning, but if you're in the middle of a presentation, they still have that visual reminder that they don't want to say something they shouldn't say that will be recorded, I guess. Uh, but at any rate, there I go on the camera sideways. And, and, so and, thank you. Yeah, and, and just a little thing about that. Uh, by default, they are recorded, but ultimately you and the professional 
have control. So if either one of you are uncomfortable with that and need it removed or don't want it to have happen, just say the word and it, and it happens, okay? Yeah, and one of the things I will also say, and, and Mark can maybe explain this why they do it this way, but when there are archives and we're showing you different examples there, you will very rarely see students on camera. So the recordings that go into the archives uh, tend to be very much just the speaker and not the students who are in the session. Uh, so you don't have to worry so much about that. But we'll talk a little bit more about classroom placement uh, after we say goodbye. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bruschi. Thank you, Mr. Lamazny. And uh, have a good day, Pflugerville. All right. Thank See you. Everybody.